Hello everyone, Peter here. Welcome to our YouTube channel as ever. Today we've got something a little bit different for you, which is a full unedited video conversation with me and the author of this book, Nicholas Guy. Nicholas Guy is an academic at the University of Cambridge, a brilliant speaker, and this is a fascinating book. It's called The Hated Cage, an American tragedy in Britain's most terrifying prison. Those of you who know a little bit about the history of art might be able to guess that from the cover illustration, we're going to be talking about the early 19th century, about a massacre and um, a fascinating piece of the early relationship in Britain and Americans' political history. If you do enjoy our conversation today and want to read a bit more, go along to Unseen Histories, who have a extract from the book with an introduction from Nick himself. But without further ado, on to the conversation itself. Hope you enjoy it. Hello, Nick. Welcome to Travels Through Time. Welcome to our podcast about the past. We're going to talk about a gloomy prison and a shocking massacre today. A story that you tell in your engrossing new book, The Hated Cage. But first, you're a professor in North American history, a fellow at Jesus College at the University of Cambridge. You've studied and taught at world class un universities on both sides of the Atlantic. So I thought it'd be really good if you could just begin by telling us a little bit about your academic career and your particular professional interests. Uh, yeah, well, first, thanks very much, Peter, for having me on. It's uh, terrific to be on the podcast. Um, yeah, I've had a kind of strange career in a way. So I started out here in the UK, uh, went to Cambridge as an undergraduate, actually starting off in English literature rather than history, um, which I don't often tell my students. I think they tend to see you as being a little bit suspect if you didn't get a history degree, uh, at least your first degree. Uh, yeah, and then I did my um, graduate work here to begin with. I went to Princeton which is very exciting in the late 90s and early 2000s. Then I taught in Vancouver for a few years at Simon Fraser University. Then I came back to England. And the one reason I mentioned that with regard to what we're chatting about today is that I actually have had the chance to teach the War of 1812 in three different countries, <laughs> in Britain, the United States, and in Canada. And I have to tell you, it's a pretty hilarious subject to teach in those three places because obviously like nobody agrees either on what happened or in particular on who won. So as I've moved around those different places, it slightly confused me actually, who won mm. and what happened. But it was one reason I was really keen to write this particular book because in some respects, this is a war that um, the culture kind of forgot, right? Particularly here in Britain. And I think in the United States, the Canadians tend to remember it a bit more than Brits and Americans do. But um, yeah, it did strike me as something that in its moment was obviously of enormous importance but in retrospect, it's kind of, you know, it's vanished beneath the waves of the past. So it's definitely something I was keen to revisit in my work at some point. Yeah, it's a good point. And I, th I think I'd broaden that out, actually, to beyond the War of 1812 to the general early history of the um, United States of America over here in Britain. And I think this is a central dynamic in your career. It's kind of transatlantic. You've, you've, you've studied in, in the UK, taught in, in the US. And um, I've always thought, and I'd really like to have your perspective on this, um, as well is that you know for reasons that might well be obvious but Britain has not really like kind of familiar with this American foundational narrative whereas in the states there's a very very strong foundational story based around the founding fathers and I've always thought that that kind of was a story that evolved early on in the 19th century when you had people like Parson Weems talking about George Washington when you had Trumbull's Declaration of Independence, which came out. And this is, um, it kind of makes an interesting narrative, whereas over here, we don't really know the history. Whereas in America, they kind of know a particular kind of history, but the actual story of what happened during that fascinating half century is sometimes a little bit distorted. Is that a fair impression, would you say? Yeah, I think, I, I think you're absolutely right. And um, I mean, one of the interesting things about it, right, is that if you think about our relationship with the United States, so I'm, by our, I mean, Britain's relationship with the United States, in a way, um, the origin part, so the American Revolution part, we are obviously aware of, but in some respects, what we really focus on, both in the culture and in many of our recollections of our past relationship with the US, is the good stuff. I mean, even now in our politics, the idea of the special relationship is absolutely enshrined, at least in our discussion. I mean, I'm not necessarily sure if the presidents in the White House are always as obsessed with the special relationship, but those two words come up all the time. And in a sense, those words are rooted in an understanding that the United States was a kind of happy 
offshoot of Britain. So in other words, that we in Britain can take some ownership of and maybe pride in the United States and its history, but whether it's religion, whether it's politics, whether it's culture, in all those areas, the United States has this kind of um, embeddedness in Britain. Uh, and in some respects, the events of the 20th century enable us to think that much more often, right? So I'm thinking especially about World War II, the Atlantic Charter, FDR and Churchill, that notion of a world order that was Anglo-American. And so let's go back to the 50 year period or 40 years maybe from 1775 to 1815 or, or maybe even earlier. So back to all of the crises after the Seven Years War with the Stamp Act, the kind of beginnings of American radical protest against Britain in the 1760s. That period from 1763 to 1815, it's kind of awkward <laughs> to that narrative of a special relationship, right? I mean, it almost looks as if we in Britain were not happy for the United States to chart its own course in the world. It's almost as if we had a very tense and often hostile relationship with the United States. So in a way, I think our predominant imagining of this relationship means that early moment in the career is kind of inconvenient to the things that we want to remember. And again, the War of 1812 was the last time that Britain and the United States went to war with each other. So it's no surprise to me that a lot of times we think about our past with the United States, it's more recent than that. And this earlier period period has been somewhat memory hold in the term of the day. Yeah, is, is that something that excites you as, as an academic and a scholar? When you know that we have, um... I suppose, strong conceptions about what this period of history meant and what it means, because history is so alive in the present, we always talk about this, but um, th there's a sense, and I got this from reading your book, of you, first of all, being quite excited, you're like kind of in the archives, you're, you're often guiding us through material in really interesting ways, but there's a sense of, um, along with the dry humour that you deliver things with, um, a sense of like kind of genuine surprise sometimes, actually, this is you know this has just been buried this and I suppose we could also say we'll bring up the massacre now because we've talked about these two particular wars as the war of independence and later on the war of 1812 but equally we could talk about two massacres which bookend this period of history in the same way so you have the the Boston massacre of 1770 which is central to the narrative of independence and then this later massacre which happens a long way from home which we'll get to shortly um and in, in, in 1815 that no one knows about. So that's that's history, isn't it? It's it's what what we remember and and it's not always what tallies at the time. No, absolutely. Um, I, I think it, that was definitely one of the questions that I became increasingly interested in as I got into the project. Maybe it's the one I started with in the sense that, you know, I, I found this project solely by taking my family on holiday to Devon, essentially kind of driving into the prison, knowing there was a prison there, but not knowing any of this prisoner of war story, the fact that it had been a war prison before it was a criminal prison. So in a sense of the, the, the confrontation with Dartmoor on my part was totally accidental. So that got me thinking about these questions regarding memory and what we choose to remember and what we choose to forget. I guess also the process of like, I mean, I say what we choose to remember. I mean, obviously there are ways in which history takes a particular form because it's willed in that way or there are ways in which the shapes of history are very clearly reflected by the economics or the politics or demographics or whatever else of, of the time and of the times after the moment we're thinking about remembering. So I guess one of the other questions in my mind was the extent to which Dartmoor had been kind of deliberately forgotten or had been kind of marooned, if you like, by the course of time. And, and on this other question of the archive, um, I mean, again, it's interesting to me, I mean, as someone who works a lot on histories of race, so in my previous work, I've been especially interested in how uh, white Americans kind of process the fact that they were living after 1776 in a national space that included very large numbers of peoples of color. So what did they do with that? Now, obviously, a lot of people who've written about the histories of Native Americans and African Americans constantly confront the fact that in archives, the experiences of those groups are often a lot harder to find. So I saw that as being a kind of subset of this bigger problem of what we remember or what we choose to remember. The specific problem of like, if the archive doesn't actually have in it the things we need to tell stories in the round, do we give up on them? Do we keep trying to tell those stories? Are there other ways around the absences, the kind of holes in the archives that can help us to tell stories? So, so those two things were linked in my mind, this bigger question of like what we remember and what we don't, and the specific question of how the gaps in the archive are obviously an obstacle to telling stories about the past, but are they an insuperable obstacle or are there other ways around them? Yeah, that's a good point. And I think one other 
um, reaction I had to your book was that the, the, the archive is immense in a way. So to square up to it in the first place, it must have been quite something just to find out where all the bits and pieces are and accessing them. That's got to be a kind of challenge in itself. But that was only the first layer, if you like, and there was um, lots of misleading parts of the archive. And and also this sense of, um, of you, I, I suppose, trying to decode what the archive meant when it did tell you something. So, for example, you're talking about different taxonomies of race, for example, and the, the language that we have today to describe things like race just did not exist. So you can see these officials in something like the transport board, um, which we might get onto later on, trying to make sense of, of, of something. And it's kind of revealing, but it's misleading at the same time, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I don't know whether or not this is the right way to sell a book. Maybe that's not even what I should be trying to do here, Peter. But if I were trying to sell a book, probably the wrong way to sell it is to say, uh, people who love bureaucracy will love this book. But it's just true, right, that like when it came to running the prison, uh, Britain, particularly through this agency, the Transport Board, which is based out of the Admiralty, it was essentially trying to capture all this information about all the people that were in prison during first the Napoleonic Wars and then the War of 1812. And so it produced these amazing documents. I mean, the prison register at Dartmoor contains the names of all six and a half thousand American prisoners, but not just the names, contains all this other amazing material. So, you know, talks about like how old they were, what they looked like, their complexion, which as you say, is a really interesting category. It doesn't necessarily mean their race, although the poor clerks who were there trying to fill this thing out when new prisoners came in, they often did try and guess what a prisoner's race is going to be. It contains distinguishing features, height, the ships they were captured on, all this crazy information. So you can kind of imagine in London, you know, the sort of beginnings of our bureaucracy, gathering all this data. But of course, they had no way to sort it, which is what's so different if you're a historian. So if, as I did, you commit to actually transcribing this enormous bloody register with six and a half thousand names, <laughs> you end up with a searchable database of the kind that the folks who created this register dreamed of having but never did. So one of the other stories in all of this is kind of, I mean, again, this is a terrible way to sell a book, but it's also kind of part of the history of information management and bureaucracy, because all of us now, we are seen so fully, so clearly by the state, right? Like, imagine all of the data points that you leave in your everyday life, Peter. I mean, God, even people downloading this podcast are probably telling something about themselves to Google, right? Or That's to... not a good way to sell this podcast either. Okay, well, but I'm just <laughs> saying that this is what, to me, I know. the origin of this incredibly interesting history of how we all become visible to states, to governments, and eventually to corporations that kind of reside in this moment. And I really enjoyed getting into that part of the archive because there's both a massive amount of material, but in its historical moment, it's actually not necessarily all that useful to the yeah. British. So you can see the beginnings of something that's going to become so important in our era. And again, by transcribing it all and creating a big database, I could basically become the big brother that Britain had hoped to be in that moment. But I know that's what I was I was thinking, because in, in a way it is an era of utopianism. People have got these great big ideas about how society should be and how they're moving in the right direction. And in a way you're fulfilling the utopian dream of the transport board in Cambridge in, in, in the early 21st century. So there we go, then maybe that's something to say about the passage of time. But another way to sell the book, which is probably a bit more catchy and one that you can elaborate on, but one that I know you've used yourself um, is this that the 20th biggest city in the United States of America in, well, I don't know, the Napoleonic Wars era, shall we say, was where? It was in Dartmoor, in Devon. Yeah, which is such a kind of fantastic and alluring fact. So I think we'll loop back around to that later on. And um, I just wanted to do one more bit of contextualization, a little bit more to do with American history. And this is maybe... I don't know how familiar this will be to our, our American listeners, but especially for um, for British listeners, just to kind of put this story within the context of how people chop up um, American history in two periods, because we're on the cusp in 18, well, in the 1810s of what they call the era of good feeling, which is something I just wanted to ask you to explain, because it's such an interesting and um, I suppose quite alien concept to us when we look at America today. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean, I should say the era of good feeling does not go on for all that long. Uh, so it refers to a period after um, the War of 1812. So from 1815 
probably through 1819. So conventionally, we'd see the end of this era, era of four years, as being uh, the crises over whether or not to admit the territory of Missouri to the United States as a slave state or a free state, and also the Panic of 1819, which is the biggest crash at that point in American history, economic crash. So really, this era does not go on for very long. And in effect, it describes a period in which the former competition between the two kind of major political parties in the United States, so the Federalist Party and the Democratic Republican Party, again, just to give that some bones for British listeners, the Federalists were people like John Adams, George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, and the Democratic Republicans, people like Thomas Jefferson and James Madison, who's the president through the events that I talk about in my book about the Dartmoor Massacre. So in effect, what you see is during this period of four years after the War of 1812, that conflict subsides, that political conflict. But to be honest, Peter, it mostly subsides because the Federalist Party kind of falls apart, which is actually a process that's been going on for some time. And as with a lot of political realignments, it's not really that there isn't kind of any politics anymore. It's just that the forces in politics of forming new groupings and new ways to kind of contest each other. So I, again, it sounds very nostalgic, right? Like, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could have an era of good feelings right now? But at the time, it wasn't felt as if everyone was kind of coming together. It was more the Federalists have been crushed, and that's a good thing. And then in a way, many of those interests come back again four years later. Is it kind of maybe another just to the early 90s, maybe when there was the fall of the wall, and then so a kind of old oppositional force had been removed so therefore it seemed like we lived in a more consensual world is that correct yeah although that's if that's the example that's the analogy that's kind of terrifying isn't it because i mean if you think about how hostile american politics became during the clinton administration in mm. particular with the republican revolution and newt mm. gingrich with all of his elephants and his contract with america i mean it did not take very long for politics mm. to roar back in so yeah i mean it's a really interesting historical moment post 1815 but i think the calm is explained more by the kind of institutional demise of a party than by any kind of great kind of excess of I mean the, the phrase the era of good feelings itself is a bit propagandistic yeah. and aspirational right yeah okay well let's get into this 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 format that we've got which always begins with me asking you the question if you could travel back to a year in the past which year would you um like to go and visit please so I'd like to go to 1815 with, with, with the, the plea, dispensation, that we might be able to creep back into the last week of 1814 for reasons I'll explain in a moment. OK, well, that's granted. I think only granted on, on the basis that you give us a little bit of a contextual overview of what the world would be like in 1815 and probably beyond the bounds of your story, even if you just want to kind of guide us um, through maybe culture or intellectual thought, politics, whatever you like. Well, it's an incredibly important year in all sorts of different ways in many parts of the world. Um, uh, I mean, f I guess for the purposes of, of, of our story or our emphasis, it's a year in which two long-standing conflicts come to an end. And obviously in 1815, people are not aware of how long this, this cessation of hostilities is going to be. In the end, it turns out to be very long indeed. So the, the conflicts I'm speaking about are those between Britain and France, and between Britain and the United States. And it's a quirk, a peculiar fact of history, that that year marks the end of conflict between Britain and both of those countries in perpetuum, right? So there is not gonna be another war between Britain and France or between Britain and the United States. Now, if you think about the history of the previous 40 or 50 years, or in the case of France, the history yeah. of like hundreds yeah. of years yeah. before that, it's pretty astonishing yeah. that 1815 is the year where, where that comes to an end. And I think this is partly a consequence of just how kind of apocalyptic, prolonged and desperate the Napoleonic Wars were. It's partly a consequence of some of the developments we're going to see in um, the development of new world orders later in the 19th century. So for various reasons, France finds itself, if not on the same side as Britain, then certainly in a place where its central goals no longer involve the forms of territorial kind of composition and conquest it's had with Britain up to that point. And for the United States, the relationship is even closer. I mean, the US is basically kind of bankrolled by Britain for a lot of the 19th century. So all that's in the future. For those people who are living in 1815, uh, certainly by the summer of that year, those conflicts between uh, Britain and France, Britain and the United States are over. But Peter, we're talking here about the start of 1815. So what I should do is be a bit more specific and say, at the beginning of 1815, 
things are much murkier. So we haven't yet had a ratification of the peace between Britain and the United States. And although Napoleon, of course, is vanquished the previous year and went into exile in 1814 to Elba, the Mediterranean island, he is about to escape from Elba and return to Paris and effectively to start up the Napoleonic Wars again. And that's a really, really important context for thinking about the kind of state of um, despair and kind of you know, paranoia that people in Britain in particular are in at the beginning of 1815. So we're on the cusp of something huge, but we're not quite there yet. Yeah, it's a year, year of huge drama, isn't it? And um, absolutely, in, in itself, if you were just to throw out the, the the story of the year eighteen fifteen, it'd be a wonderfully dramatic um, kind of narrative. And I suppose one of the other things that we should probably stress is just how long this war had been going on between Britain and France. Is is probably if you were born. I mean, if you were someone 25 years old, you probably wouldn't have known much else yeah. apart from war. That And it had kind of come to every parish, hadn't it? Because they had, they had the ballots. So there was lots of the sense that you had to kind of be in this dad's army of... Um, and there was many points where an invasion of the British Isles was threatened and very nearly executed. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. That's an extremely important point. Um, with the exception of that very, very brief moment uh, with the Treaty of Amiens, so yeah. effectively sort of 1802, 1803, you have constant warfare from 1794 right all the way through until 1814, when again, we get that little cessation when Napoleon goes off and everything seems to be over. But it's like a bad horror movie, you know, where you think you've killed the villain and the villain comes back again. Sorry, this is a very British perspective. Uh, but, you know, then Napoleon emerges, right? You know, having a apparently- lot of people would agree movie. about Napoleon. <laughs> well, right. Although again, it's the, the, Amer the American view of Napoleon is very interesting. Um, and of course, the other thing about Napoleon is, I should say this now, because we may not get to it later, there is a strong suspicion that he may come to the United States. So that's effectively where he eventually makes for later in 1815, and he's captured by the British. But one of the really, really interesting questions, a kind of big kind of un unanswered question in American history, what would have happened if Napoleon had been in the United States in exile from the second half of 1815? And I should tell you, Peter, I was reading this recently, this is actually discussed by American presidents. So this is something that James Madison and James Monroe, the Secretary of State, are actually discussing. Like, what will the protocol be if Napoleon winds up in the United States? So Americans wow. always had a more complicated relationship with him than the Brits did. It might have changed the era of good feeling. It might have had <laughs> a kind of slightly different cast. Of it. Okay, all right. Well, let's get going then. So um, it's we're, we're poised. And where would you like to go for your first scene? We're going to dip back into 1814. Whereabouts should we go? Yeah, I was going to say, so So this is a time machine, but it also has the ability to be able to go to different places in space. Yes, it does. It's, it's quite a, um, well, how should we say, it's not a very well-defined time machine. It goes where we, where we will it to go, um, but it will follow your orders for the moment. So where should we take it to? Well, you guys have done well to keep this under wraps. Um, okay, we're going to we're going to Ghent in Belgium, okay. and we're going to head for Christmas Eve of eighteen fourteen. So again, I'm begging you just to dip back into the very last week of the year. And the reason that we're heading to Ghent, which might seem rather an unlikely place to go, is that actually that's where British and American negotiators have been holed up since the spring of eighteen fourteen, looking for a way to try to end. The War of 1812. This is a good uh, opportunity that... for me, well, just to ask you broadly, if you can, if you, I mean, you've been teaching it for so many years, if that helps you distill the story of the War of 1812 down for us into, what, what was it? What was at stake? Why were they fighting? Well, okay, so on the American side, there are a couple of objectives. So one of the, well, maybe we should say th three things just to keep it simple. So one objective is to try and secure American neutrality uh, on the oceans. So effectively to try and ensure that American ships could trade with whomever they liked, even if parties in Europe or elsewhere were warring with each other. And this is something that American statesmen have been trying to secure pretty much since the end of the American Revolution, but which Britain and France have been at different moments reluctant to accept. And part of the British and French reluctance is based on the idea that they thought that their um, antagonists, so the other party in Europe, as it were, either Napoleon or the British, might benefit if the Americans were allowed freely to trade with both nations. So effectively, they wanted to kind of monopolize American commerce for themselves and their allies. But the other problem is that um, uh, the Brits have been regularly stopping American ships and seizing sailors from those ships and putting them in the Royal Navy. So this practice known as impressment clearly was legal, 
in Britain, uh, in times of war in particular. So effectively, if you're on a British ship, you could be impressed into the Royal Navy if the Navy needed your services. What made it controversial is these were not British ships, these were American ships. But again, it's complicated because there were actually quite a few British sailors on those American ships. So there was this sort of complicated battle between the Americans and the British diplomatically over whether the United States had a right to protest the fact that sailors are being dragged from American ships. And, and let me be clear, Peter, some of those sailors were certainly American. So it wasn't just the case that Britain was taking British sailors from American ships, they were also taking Americans too. So that's very quickly, that's one of the causes. Another one is there's been a major fight uh, in the American interior, particularly around the area of the Ohio Valley. So that's the Ohio River that runs from sort of past Pittsburgh all the way to the Mississippi River. The area north of the Ohio River, so what's now the um, Midwest, I guess, places like Ohio, Indiana, um, eventually over into Illinois, um, but Ohio and Indiana in particular, there's been a big indigenous uprising. Britain has effectively been supporting it. It's an uprising against the United States and against American settlers. Uh, and that conflict between indigenous people and American militia and eventually the American army with British forces helping indigenous people, that's actually already started in 1811. So that bleeds into the War of 1812. And then the final theater is Canada. So an effort on the part of US Americans to invade Canada in 1812 with the belief that either Canada will finally come to its senses and decide that it wants to be US American Canadians are really stubborn and don't do that. Uh, but Americans are always surprised that Canadians don't want to be American. So either that will happen or the US will be able to capture Canada and use it as a kind of bargaining chip to get neutrality at sea. So those are the kind of three major threads of the War of 1812 from the American side. I think from the British side, it's like, oh, this sucks. Like <laughs> we already have an existential war with France. That's way more important. But if the Americans are going to force us to fight them as well, all right, we'll do it. So it's the US that declares war on, uh, on Britain, not Britain that declares war on the United States initially. And I think there is a certain weariness about the British prosecution of the war with the United States because France is the, is the biggest threat, right? I mean, Napoleon is a serious, serious threat. The United States is more of an irritant. Mm -hmm. So let's go back to Gantt. So this story has played out over the last few years. Um, I think the most... I suppose, visually um, striking moment from the war is the, the burning of the White House. Is that right? When um, That's right, in August of 1814. So that's very recent news in this case. Um, what happens at Ghent? Well, so from the beginning of the negotiations back in the spring of 1814, I think there's been a, um, uh, a willingness on both sides to accept the fact that this war is not a massive benefit either to Britain or the United States. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, neither side has achieved kind of instant wins or easy gains. The Americans have failed to invade Canada. Uh, the Brits can certainly project power. I mean, they haven't done it yet, but in the summer of 1814, they've shown that they can burn a city like Washington, that they can seize parts of northern Massachusetts, so what's now the state of Maine, they can do all that stuff. But can they hold it? Well, they couldn't during the Revolutionary War. So there is a bit of a stalemate that's already there. I should also say that um, one of the major kind of um, casus belli of the war, which was um, the British Orders in Council, so the British kind of protocol which enabled Britain to force the United States effectively only to trade with Britain on pain of American ships being attacked, that's actually revoked even before the war begins. So you know, like you're familiar with this and your listeners will be too. One of the kind of nightmares of, of, of geo kind of uh, politics of, um, you know, geo strategy before the invention of things like CNN or certainly the invention of the telegraph is that lots of wars begin or end for crazy reasons when something on the other side of the world has already happened, which might change that outcome. <laughs> so in this instance, famously, these orders in council are revoked by the parliament before the US Congress declares war in June of 1812. So Britain is already in a place where it doesn't really want this war. The Americans uh, don't really want the war either. But during those initial negotiations, Britain digs in on two really important points. I think one of which you probably haven't heard of, the other one may be a bit more familiar. The, the one that you may have heard of is that the Brits basically refuse to give any promises on this practice of impressment. So actually, the Britain refuses to say to Americans, yeah, we're going to give you the deal that you want. We're going to promise not to stop American ships in the future and to seize sailors for the Royal Navy from your ships. Now, that's a massive problem for our negotiators, right? Because the negotiators are like, well, this is one of the major war aims and we'll have to go back and sell this to Congress and our public. We haven't actually got anything from the Brits on that huge point. 
But here's the other one. And again, this is much less well known. The British negotiators propose that these areas of what's now in the United States, the Midwest, so states like Ohio and Indiana and Michigan, should become a permanent buffer zone between Canada and the United States, and that they would be governed by indigenous people. Now, before you get sort of all teary-eyed about how great the British are and how kind of woke they are or whatever, this is not in any way intended to help indigenous people. This is all about using our British alliances with Indians against the United States, about protecting Canada by having this big zone, this big space of indigenous power between the British colony and this kind of hungry, kind of sharp-toothed American nation. But the negotiators on the British side really dig in to begin with. And I can tell you from having read the diplomatic correspondence, everyone in the US on the diplomatic side freaks out at this suggestion that there's gonna be a big indigenous kind of zone, a kind of neutral zone, if you like, of indigenous power. And that becomes the place where these negotiators from the American side are desperate to squeeze. And you could even make the case that one of the reasons the US prolongs the war and is reluctant to sign up to a peace deal before the second half of 1814 is because they can't get any movement from Britain on this. And it's, it's critical to the future of the United States, right? I mean, imagine if today, we have this, I mean, it's really hard to imagine a world in which that indigenous zone had succeeded, but that was the British proposal. Yeah, it's fascinating, isn't it? And this is comes at least, what, 20, 30 years before this idea or concept of manifest destiny is really instilled within America. So you can see the United States at this at this kind of teenage year and it's, I, I just, in, in its development, whereas you know, you've still got characters like Jefferson and Adams who are still alive from the original kind of um, history of the founding of the Republic. So is there anyone um, in Ghent of this kind of great generation of Americans um, that, that go over there? Who, who, who's involved? Well, well John, Quin John Quincy Adams is there. Yeah. So John Quincy Adams is the guy that's kind of the point person. So he, of course, is the son of John Adams and will carry on to become uh, president of the United States. Uh, he wins the 1820 election. So um, I'm sorry, he wins the 1824 election. So from 1825 to 1829, uh, he is the American president. And he's also kind of renowned as a diplomat. So he's been um, on the ministerial mission to Russia. So he is somebody who is providing information about what's happening at Gen. Um, but I should say, you mentioned Jefferson. What's so interesting about Jefferson, who is very much still around, so he's going to carry on being on the scene, not necessarily like in the front of politics after he retires from the presidency in 1809, but he's very closely advising his successors in the White House, James Madison and James Monroe. In 1813, Jefferson writes to, of all people, um, Baron von Humboldt, Alexander von Humboldt, the great explorer, yeah. and says to him, wow, wouldn't it have been awesome if Britain hadn't messed around with the Indians? If they only Britain hadn't done that, we'd have brought the Indians into the United States, we'd have made them all citizens, like we'd have erased all these differences, physical differences between us. But of course, Britain had to mess everything up. It had to contaminate the Indians against us and so on and so on. And of course, what's fascinating about that is it, it kind of suggests this sort of transference of blame. So rather than Jefferson admitting that it's actually, as he said, manifest destiny or land hunger or whatever you want to, settler colonialism, whatever phrase you want to use, on the American side, which has effectively forced this confrontation between indigenous people in the United States, Jefferson tells von Humboldt, well, really, it's Britain. And I think that notion of Britain interfering with indigenous people, it's so important for people to think about because very often when you think about America in the 19th century, you think about the West, you almost imagine as a reader, I guess, or as someone who's not a kind of professional historian, that that's empty land or that that's land the United States is waiting to kind of expand into. Maybe the best way to think about this period and especially this kind of Indian conflict is it's basically foreign policy. I mean, these different native nations really are foreign nations, they're foreign powers, but partly because the US developed the way it did and it got as big as it did, we've kind of forgotten that that whole process of what the US is doing in the interior is also foreign policy. And that's why I'm so keen to bring it into our discussion of 1812, because yeah. it's not like that's domestic policy and all the maritime neutrality stuff is foreign policy. That was foreign policy 
too, which is why Britain's proposal for this buffer state was such an interesting and important one. Yeah, and also it's it's a really interesting peek into Jefferson's psyche, that particular letter to von Humboldt, because we always talk, don't we, about that that paradox of Jefferson's, you know, he, he wrote the Declaration of Independence and had all those slaves on Monticello. And it seems that he, um, in, in this mo- particular moment, is... Is, a, is kind of going through a similar like kind of squaring of a circle whereas he's trying to like kind of live his ideals of having this great republic where anyone can kind of call it home but it's not happening so there has to be some kind of rational explanation and it seems to be the british contamination policy it's 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 what he's settled on and it may well be it may well be the case i don't know but it's as i yeah. say it's it's nice to kind of pick on pick up on that um over um like kind of in, in combination with the other issue um yeah so I, I should just say peter quickly then so in december of 20 december of 1814 what's happened in signing the treaty is that the american side has gotten britain to give up on this idea of a neutral zone a buffer zone a kind of border region where the us is willing to acknowledge indigenous power that's gone so in a way this is, again, the huge irony, I guess, of this whole conflict, that what makes it possible for our American negotiators to sign on the dotted line in Ghent on Christmas Eve of 1814 is not the impressment issue, the neutrality at sea issue. Like Britain does not give ground on that. What actually makes the treaty possible is Britain's uh, decision reluctantly to allow the United States to do what it likes with indigenous people. So again, it's sort of maybe upset or capsizes our idea of what the conflict is about, rather than thinking about it being about foreign policy in the Atlantic, it's really about foreign policy in the American interior. And indigenous people are obviously very upset about this, but they're also already used to seeing Britain as a fair weather friend. They know that Britain allies with them when it suits Britain. So you find the indigenous nations of the region not massively surprised to learn that they end up being abandoned by Britain in the Treaty of Ghent. Yeah, it's really fascinating. And it is a bit of a hinge moment. And I, sh- I think we were, what you kind of would like to do at this moment as well is just before we before we get there, let's take a look from Ghent Let's imagine we have a very good telescope, shall we? That's where all the good lens grinders used to come from, those kind of countries. So let's imagine we had a very good one that could, could just just as like kind of 1814 was ending and the Treaty of Ghent was being signed. Do you want to just sketch what's happening at Dartmoor before we move there into our second scene? Because I think that's where we're headed. But um, more of a quick overview than a... Yeah, OK. Yeah, let me do that for you. So um, Dartmoor is the largest prison facility anywhere in the British Empire. Uh, It is uh, made up of seven large prison blocks, each one of which has three floors arranged in a kind of semicircle. Um, And these prison blocks could hold potentially more than 10,000 people. By the end of 1814, they hold around five, maybe five and a half thousand American prisoners of war. Uh, I won't get into the story of how the prison was built, but effectively it was opened in 1809 as a dedicated war prison. So Britain was intending for it to replace its dependence on prison hulks. So those former Navy ships, which have been decommissioned as, as, as naval vessels and instead now are there just to hold prisoners. These were perceived to be incredibly unsanitary. They were quite expensive, actually. So the thought was that uh, a prison on land would make much more sense. You might be surprised that it was built out of granite, <laughs> which you might see as a fairly crazy uh, material with which to build a temporary prison. Uh, But again, one of the crazy things about um, the Napoleonic War is that by 1806, when construction of the prison begins, wood's quite hard to come by. So timber is basically going to the naval yards, right, to repair or to build new ships. So there's a good supply of granite on Dartmoor that's used to build the prison. So we have five and a half thousand American sailors who are stuck there by the end of 1814. Some of them have been in captivity for more than five years. Now, if you do the maths, you're like, well, how could they have been in captivity for more than five years if the War of 1812 began in 1812? Well, they were captured on French ships. So actually, they have been brought into the prison as French prisoners of war. And then when the French were all released after Napoleon's initial surrender in the spring of 1814, these poor Americans had just moved over into the American prison register. So there's a bunch of them who've been there for that long. The majority of these prisoners have been held for more than a year. And they're pretty desperate because Dartmoor is cold. Dartmoor is disease ridden. 
Dartmoor is uh, massively exposed just in terms of the elements. Uh, and it's also a place where at that point, the uncertainty about how long the war would continue for is driving the prisoners to a state of real kind of despair. So think about our five and a half thousand Americans, overwhelmingly sailors, most of them from the commercial uh, Navy rather than from the US Navy, so from the Merchant Marine. The US Navy is pretty tiny in the War of 1812. Uh, so all of these regular kind of civilians in effect who've been forced to go off and sail during the War of 1812, absolutely fearing for their lives, hoping the war is going to end at any moment, but fearing that it won't end and that they'll die before they can get out. Well, let's go and see them. Where would you like to go for your second scene? Okay, we're going to jump ahead a little. Um, we're going to move to March of 1815. And in particular, we're going to move to the 26th of March at Dartmoor. So just to set the scene a tiny bit, uh, news reaches Dartmoor that the Treaty of Ghent has been signed on the last day of 1814. So we know this from prisoners' diaries. There are a few prisoners that wrote journals and diaries contemporaneously, so we have those. Everyone is super excited at the fact that the treaty has been signed. But you know the next thing that has to happen is the treaty has to be ratified in London. Then the treaty has to be ratified in Washington. And even more exasperatingly or desperately, news of the ratification in Washington has to make its way all the way back to Britain before these guys know that they can get out, right? Well, here's the crazy part, Peter. That news does actually arrive in the middle of March. So it gets there around the 17th, the 18th of March. It arrives in Dartmoor. So everyone knows the war is now over, but the men are not allowed to leave. And the reason the men are not allowed to leave is that both the British and these men's representative, the American representative, the, the only diplomat in the United Kingdom, in Britain, during the War of 1812, a guy called Reuben Beasley, he has decided to keep the men in Dartmoor until he can organize a flotilla of evacuation ships which can take them back to the United States. So these guys in Dartmoor before the 26th of March are like, the war is over. It's been over for a while. It's been over for so long that the ships brought news of it being over back from the United States. Why the hell are we still here? And as you can imagine, tensions begin to build before the 26th of March. So it's a good time for me to ask you to elaborate on what you perhaps hinted at earlier, where you mentioned about the poor conditions within the prison. What was life like for these um, marooned 5,000 inmates of Dartmoor prison? Uh, it was tough. Um, so the prison had been built supposedly on humane principles. So the notion originally, a bit like as you said earlier, Peter, this notion of it being a kind of utopian project. Uh, a lot of ideas around this time about building prisons uh, are really kind of coming from an interest in the criminal prison. So again, this is something you may have, or your listeners may know a bit more about, but um, this is really the moment where the modern criminal prison gets invented. So you know, like the idea of prisoners being a destination rather than a holding point before you decide what to do with, with prisoners. So, you know, to kill them or to have corporal punishment or send them to Australia or some other terrible outcome. Like that's what prisons are in the 18th century. In the 19th century, you begin to get the idea of the penitentiaries or prisons, a place that can kind of improve people who've done bad things. Now, Dartmoor is very much kind of being created in that moment where all these ideas about prisons as improving are coming to the fore. But the crucial thing about war prisoners, the people in it aren't supposed to need rehabilitation, right? I mean, they're just unfortunate people who are caught fighting for the wrong side. At the same time, there's a strong awareness among prison reformers that unless you get a prison right, it's a place where people's morals will take a nosedive. So even prisoners of war may end up being kind of morally stained if you put them in the wrong kind of prison. So when Dartmoor was created, had all these ideas about how actually it might be set up more humanely. Some of those ideas were just plainly nuts. So for example, you would be able to stop disease in the prison by ensuring that you had massive open windows with bars across them and these giant prison blocks. Well, I don't know if you spent time in Dartmoor during the winter, Peter, but to me, that is not a particularly good recipe for a happy prisoner kind of population. So actually, the cold and that sense that you never get warm at Dartmoor grinds people's morale and becomes a kind of basic fact, uh, you know, of their um, misery from day to day. 
Then there's the problems of supplying that many prisoners with food. So there are strict rations issued by the British, but most of the food is supplied by contractors. There are regular fights about its quality and even its quantity. So just that kind of daily routine of whether or not you get fed, all of that basically is something that the prisoners face from day to day. Then there are disputes and tensions among the prisoners. Now, again, unlike in a modern prison, we have cells. So in effect, prisoners are kind of individually contained. And when they interact with each other, it's kind of heavily supervised, or at least that's the theory. During uh, this moment, this war prison was basically, as I said earlier, these seven prison blocks, each had three floors, and there were no divisions. So you had these poles running down the middle of the prison blocks where you would hang your hammocks at night. But then during the day, the hammocks would come down and you could kind of go where you wanted within your block. You were also allowed for most of this period to visit the other prison blocks. Now, on the one hand, this enabled the prisoners to create some amazing kind of communities and do some incredible things, which we could get into. It also allowed for tensions, allowed for arguments, and sometimes allowed for physical confrontations between different groups of prisoners, which could make the prison a very dangerous place to be. So that lack of kind of close oversight by the British authorities, very different from a modern criminal prison, there were possibilities there for these American sailors, but there were also huge dangers. Mm -hmm. So I think combined with the hopelessness, right, and just the sense of indeterminacy, people have no idea when the sentence is going to end. They know the bodies are mounting up in the infirmary because people are dying of typhus. These other factors meant that this was a particularly kind of grim place for sailors to end up. Yeah, I think to me, reading um, your account of this, it seems like your concern is very much for the individuals who are caught in the system, caught in this historical moment, which has created this particular um, prison and the intellectual environment that sustains it, where you have things like the Transport Board who are basically managing it from London. So you'd have these quite preposterous kind of like chains of communication which had to go up and down all the time often people didn't understand what was happening but if we are thinking about the individuals can you just tell us maybe like give us a couple of the kind of people who might have been in there just to kind of give them a bit of a um a moment in in 2022 who who, who were these people yeah i mean i can tell you about a couple um uh, maybe to to give you sort of opposite extremes well, well generally they were very young right so by and large, the prisoners were, uh, I think the average age, um, and I know this because I've transcribed the prison register, the average age is like 24, 25. So we're talking about fairly young population. Um, one of the characters I follow through is this uh, really fabulously interesting guy called Frank Palmer. Uh, and Frank Palmer was from Connecticut, uh, went off um, to kind of join up with a privateer in 1814. Uh, so had these kind of youthful ideas about what the sea would look like, and then got captured literally on his first day on this privateering vessel. And he got captured partly because Britain had this blockade around the American coast during the War of 1812, and he failed to break through it. So he's immediately captured. He's taken to the Caribbean. So he spends time on the prison ship there. Then he's dragged all the way up to Canada, and he spends time in a British prison in Nova Scotia. And then finally, in the late summer of 1814, he's dragged all the way across the Atlantic. Now, I mean, you know, if you fly to the US these days, I mean, maybe even your listeners will be like, well, sometimes it's a hassle. Oh, I got jet lagged. I mean, imagine how horrible it would be when you believe this war is about to end, to find yourself in Nova Scotia, North America, dragged across on a British guard ship all the way to, to England and to find yourself in Dartmoor in September of 1814. So Frank Palmer was a wonderful character for me because his diary more kind of um, powerfully and sharply than any source I could have imagined describes this sense of frustration and despair surrounding indeterminacy. So Palmer does an incredible job of showing us in his diary what a nightmare it was to live through this, this, this agonizing lack of clarity on how long people would be in a prison. So, so he, he, for me, was a wonderful character, fabulously interesting, had been to lots of places, and I really felt like I could kind of access this kind of emotional world. Just to give you another example, kind of from the other end of things, I also write about a prisoner called Thomas Jackson. And Thomas Jackson is someone that the archive has absolutely left behind. Thomas Jackson was an African-American. The register said that he was from New York. We don't know if that meant New York City, although probably it did. 
We know that he was 14 years old when he was brought to the prison in February of 1815. So again, just to clarify, he is brought into Dartmoor prison after the war has ended. And here's the crazy thing, Peter, he's brought in from the Royal Navy. So he'd actually been serving in the Royal Navy during the War of 1812. Now, I'm fairly sure that the Royal Navy discarded him in the autumn of 1814, thinking the war was over. So he was effectively demobbed. But then, like a lot of Americans who'd been in the Royal Navy, rather than them just being freed, they were tipped into the British prison system. Now, I cannot tell you if Thomas Jackson of New York was in the Royal Navy absolutely against his will, or if, in effect, this boy, right, this child, had been in the Royal Navy for some time and had perhaps stopped thinking about himself as American. Maybe he never thought of himself as American. We have no way of knowing. And Thomas Jackson is someone who, uh, to give you a spoiler, well, maybe we can revisit Thomas Jackson when we get to our final moment. So I'll just plant the seed right now that he is an African-American boy, sailor, who finds himself in Dartmoor after the war has ended, but still in Dartmoor on March the 26th and still in Dartmoor the following month uh, when we get to the massacre. And we know little about him, but obviously his experience looks very different from the experience of Frank Palmer, who very much signed up for the war. Yeah. And, and, and again, we won't get into this because we don't have the time, but it's in your, in your writing and, and you do look at a number of these inmates in quite, quite some detail. And, and, and it's a space where identity is fluid, where people have these kind of, I suppose, amorphous lives where you're not quite sure all the time where they come from, even what they look like or where their allegiances lie. And, and that's a kind of interesting thing. But there are some some kind of quite sharp distinctions. You, you talk about at one point that the prison becomes America's first segregated prison when there's a kind of division between people of different races, which is in itself historically significant, I think. And I suppose there's this idea is uh, which, which we should throw into this as well it is still a hierarchical time and a lot of these people come from ships where there's a very um well established chain of command shall we say and they're all kind of leveled aren't they in 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 the prison which is quite interesting so you'll have a captain of a ship thrown in and there's a worry that it's therefore kind of degenerative to the society and their, their understanding of power structures so there's so much there which we can leave people to go and read about but what happens on the 26th of march i should ask you that most important okay question. so you, no absolutely so i mentioned that um uh that the american uh, consul in london so the only american diplomat in london this guy reuben beasley had actually agreed to keep the americans in dartmoor until he could organize their evacuation. Uh, I won't get into Beasley now at great length, but just to say that he became a kind of great anti-hero of my book, partly because uh, this moment in history is one where the whole idea of the kind of foreign service is super amateur on the American side. So basically the consuls that the United States appoints around the world supposedly to help uh, American civilians or American kind of business people or whatever who find themselves overseas, they're paid a pittance by the United States. The assumption is that they'll accept these consular positions because it will let them get on with their business dealings. Now, obviously, that's fine, potentially. Maybe it's not fine, but it's not like nightmarish in a time of peace. In a time of war, it's completely nightmarish because our Virginian merchant, who happens to be the US consul in London, Reuben Beasley, basically the Brits are his business partners. Like he doesn't want to get in their faces. Like he doesn't want to give them an incredibly hard time. And yet that's part of his job uh, by dint of being consul. So actually he's also a sort of, you imagine him as the sort of guy who would like wear gloves a lot when he goes around and meets people. You know, he has a kind of aversion mm -hmm. to actually getting his hands dirty. So the prisoners come to hate him from a very early stage. He only visits Dartmoor once during the war and his appearance is kind of disastrous. The prisoners apparently overhear him saying to one of his assistants, oh, it's not as bad as I thought, which again circulates around the prison and turns him into this villainous figure. But uh, he effectively writes to the prisoners at Dartmoor in the third week of March, 1815, to tell them that they're staying in a the prison, that he's not gonna let them out, 
He has actually let a few of them with money out, which again, very much upset the rest of the prisoners. But he has sent them this rather chiding letter saying, stay put, I'm going to tell you what to do. This is what your nation requires of you. So that really becomes the kind of uh, moment where the American prisoners snap. So on the 26th of March, 1815, if we found ourselves in the main prison yard at Dartmoor, we could look up and see hundreds of prisoners conducting their own trial of Reuben Beasley. So American prisoners putting on trial their own consul. Now, Reuben Beasley was not there in person, but he was ably represented by an effigy, which the prisoners have made from old bed sheets and straw. So effectively, they have a, a really stylized kind of performative hearing where they read this long list of charges. Then they ask Beasley uh, if he has anything to say in response. He doesn't. Uh, he is guiltily silent. Uh, and then they uh, hang him up. So they effectively hang him from one of the prison roofs. And then once um, they're sure that he's dead, uh, they throw his, his corpse, quote unquote, down to the ground and set it on fire. So I think it's extraordinary, again, to go back to what you said a moment ago, Peter, about the fluid nature of identity in all of this. To me, it's incredible that these American prisoners, in effect, seem to place almost as much, maybe as much blame on their own consul, their own state representative, as they did on the British. So I think that there is a very you, strong sense. Yeah, yeah. but it kind of, it, it, when you describe this to me, a few things, I suppose it's, it, it's a, a, oh, what should we say, a habit that's dropped out of our political discussion, the, the, the burning in effigy. Maybe it happens at Lewis occasionally. <laughs> Maybe we've, we've lost that, that trick in our arsenal. But the, the, the other thing is it, it reminds you immediately of the Stamp Act and, and 1765 and this kind of connection with the figure of authority, the local figure of authority being held or, or, or the representative of the crime. And that's, it's that same kind of dynamic, isn't it? That's that's what I, I, I think. Yeah, and I, and, and I think there's a tension here about st states and individuals, right? Mm. I mean, if you think about the American Revolution, in effect, the American Revolution could be understood as this kind of hyper-patriotic attempt to set up your own state, could also be understood as an attempt by like-minded, ideologically congruent individuals to escape from a state. So it's more about leaving an overpowering and tyrannical state than setting up your own. And I think this is one of the challenges that war, especially in this period, kind of sets to individuals because the state is rarely more powerful than it is during times of war. But that means that individuals can find themselves putting a lot on the line and having very kind of high expectations that the state will reimburse them for what they have risked in the name of the nation, right? And I think for these Americans at Dartmoor, it's that sense of betrayal, that sense that they have risked their lives by going off to fight on the seas for the United States. And now their own consul is keeping them in this huge, creepy and deadly prison. In effect, it really does force them to think again about whether their government is helping them or whether their government has become kind of part of the problem. And again, I think we are, it's really, for me, for, for general readers, for academics, I mean, we should all be really interested in this question of how we came to accept that kind of states were the basic building block of our experience as individuals. And this is very much a moment where outside of wartime, you don't see a lot of the state if you're an American. You see a bit more of it if you're a Brit, but as an American, that was sort of the point of the revolution that you could get away from the state, right? Well, for these poor sailors, they suddenly really needed the state and they were in this prison solely because they were American. And when they needed their government, it wasn't there for them. And that's why they, they, they hanged and burned this effigy of Reuben Beasley. Yeah, it's a fascinating moment in the growth of states, isn't it? So that's one it we is. could leave hanging. But let's let, let's move on to what what has to be the conclusion of this story. Where, where does this go to next? Well, we will stay in Dartmoor, uh, but we are going to advance the clock uh, by just just less than two weeks. So we're going to go to the sixth of April, eighteen fifteen. And the first thing I should say, no, please. The first thing I should say about the sixth of April is that the weather was good. And that definitely is worth remarking on since we're talking about Dartmoor. Yeah. Uh, and it does actually have a material impact on our story because what that meant is that the prisoners all found themselves out in the prison yards rather than hanging out within the prison blocks where they were for virtually all of the winter and often a lot of the summer as well. So that morning, uh, there were some high-spirited kind of hijinks things going on. There was also a game of what was probably baseball, 
Although I'm quite careful about this because baseball historians are the most vicious and terrifying of all historians, and they might want to tell a different story about the game's origins. But certainly on the basis of reading our primary accounts of what happened, it looks as if the Americans were playing a game where they whacked something, uh, flew up in the air, ran around some bases. Uh, and when they were playing this game, the ball flew over one of the inner walls of the prison and ended up in the yard on the other side of a wall where the barracks, which contained the guards, the prison guards, where that barracks was situated. And what would happen every other day is that a guard on that side of the wall would just throw the ball back. On this particular day, the 6th of, uh, 6th of April, 1815, the guard did not throw the ball back. Uh, that was the beginning of the nightmare that would uh, that would sort of follow through for the rest of the day. Yeah, we um, I think we should I'll kind of allude to a different episode we did with a with a historian you might know, Mike, Malcolm Gaskell, and he talked. Oh yeah, he, he talked to us about um, the history of emotions, and he said it's so interesting for him to look how that you know how the same event will kind of play out so differently when there's a different emotional climate surrounding. And, and it seems to me on this particular day, there is a very definite, very distinct and very, very dangerous emotional climate around the prison, which um, has obviously been generated over the course of, of the past several months. And take us forward to, to, to the events that kind of succeeded, if they are indeed clear, because I know often when these things happen, they happen in ways that are very contested and very difficult for the historian to kind of recover. Did you manage to find out with any clarity what happened next? Yeah, um, I mean, on that emotional climate point, first of all, you're absolutely right that uh, I've mentioned already the kind of despair inherent in all of this. What perhaps we should have picked up on earlier is that the return of Napoleon, so the fact that Napoleon has marched back to Paris in, 18, in March of 1815, is massively important to our story because what this means for Britain is that every available ship, every commercial ship is now gonna be commandeered by the transport board, which also has that as part of its brief. And though it's gonna be filled up with, with, with men, with, with weapons, with material, with supplies and sent to France, right? Or sent across the channel with the hopes that Britain can, can have one kind of climactic, one final battle with Napoleon. Now I mentioned earlier that the reason the Americans are stuck in Dartmoor is that the consul, the US consul, Reuben Beasley, has said that he needs to organize ships. Well, he's now finding himself competing in trying to charter these ships with the British government. And that's a war he's never gonna win. Like they are always gonna get the ships, he's not gonna get them. So another quirk of history is that Napoleon's return means the evacuation of these Dartmoor prisoners gets postponed. And prisoners have heard rumors, it might be more than a year before they end up being released. So that's very much seeping into this moment, this sunny day on April the 6th, 1815, with people playing baseball, people milling about the yards, but behind the kind of cosmetic sense that this is a group of men, young men, enjoying a sunny day, there's that sort of like dry kind of, you know, tinder, right, of dissatisfaction and kind of despair and dread about what may still face them in the prison. So, the ball flies over the wall, the British soldier on the other side, um, I should say it's a member of the, one of the British militias, the Somersetshire militia, so militias form the prison guards at Dartmoor, and this particular militia is from fairly close by, from Somersetshire, it's based about 70 miles away from Dartmoor. Uh, so those militiamen kind of live in or beside the prison, they refuse to throw the ball back. The Americans have seen that this inner wall of the prison has one stone loose. So a bunch of the American prisoners go to one of the prison blocks, they prize down from the windows one of the bars that covers up these big giant windows letting air into the blocks, and they begin using it as a crowbar to work away at that loose stone. They keep going and they keep going over several hours. There are a bunch of other hijinks going on in the prison yards which distract some of the militia guards from what's happening. Eventually, a prisoner manages to get all the way through this hole to go looking for the ball, is spotted by a malicious guard, militia guard. The militia freak out. Suddenly there's a kind of alarm sounded in a prison and the militia guards tell the prison governor, uh, who's a Royal Navy captain, uh, that actually there's a breakout happening, that the Americans are trying to escape. 
Now, again, like the idea they're trying to escape is completely nuts. Like it's very hard to get out of Dartmoor and notion they would break out en masse, but that's not what they were trying to do. But on the British side, that's what the suspicion is. So at that moment in the day, there is suddenly an order given that the militia need to be drawn up in the kind of main square of the prison and that they need to be ready for an uprising of the prisoners. And of course, once the militia are drawn up, they're brought together in the middle of the prison. Lots of American prisoners come to this central area of the prison, begin shaking at the bars and pushing at the locked gate to see if they can get into that space to kind of challenge the guards. They break through the gate. And then finally, by the evening of April 6, you have this confrontation. You have hundreds of prisoners spilling into the central yard of the prison and effectively saying to the prisoners, shoot us, shoot us. So goading the prison guards to open fire. And I mean, at that point, I guess the fate of all of this is already sealed. But it is important that I stress that we get to this position through a misunderstanding. The Americans, I think, were not trying to break out. The British assumed that they were, and that's what produced this standoff. Is there any, you know, let's do the imaginif imaginative portion of this, because is, is there anything in particular that you would have liked to have looked over that scene to, to work? To? Was there anything that was elusive to you when you were researching it? Was there a particular character who you became interested in? Was there a like kind of dead end that you would like to kind of solve in a way? Yeah, I mean, one thing in particular is that it's clear that some of the prisoners did not want this confrontation to happen. So uh, we know from some of the um, uh, published accounts that um, uh, the different committees of prisoners, which are basically the kind of elected bodies which prisoners have produced to reach decisions about whether a particular prisoner should be punished for stealing. or So these are basically these kind of little um, prisoner groups within each prison, each prison block, that some of them had seemed to be trying to stop um, this mischief. So we know that there's a message to get sent out to tell the guys with the crowbar that they should stop crowbarring the wall. Mm -hmm. Similarly, We've got at this point, um, maybe 900 or so African-Americans in their own prison block. So we haven't got time to get into this, but you know, one of the crazy things about Dartmoor is there is actually a kind of segregated prison block, which is known as prison four or the black prison, which is right in the middle uh, of, of Dartmoor. Uh, we know from some accounts that African-Americans were less likely to get involved in this confrontation. We know in particular that this very mysterious and fascinating figure who seemed to preside over this black prison block, a guy called King Dick, his real name is Richard Crafers. We know that actually he consciously decided not to go to the central square to get involved in the confrontation. In fact, he went to the loo <laughs> and he stayed in the loo for the whole thing. And again, one of the questions I ask in the book is like, did that make him kind of like, did that make him a coward? Like, was it his duty to go off and try and get involved in this confrontation with the prison guards? So one thing I'd love to do if I had the chance of being there is actually get a sense of these kind of like um, counter tides, you know, these efforts to try and maybe stay away from confrontation, because it's pretty clear to me that the prisoners were not united as a single block in the beginnings of this uprising, that there were voices of restraint and there were also attempts to keep out of it. And again, I don't judge those people at all. I'm not necessarily sure that we should necessarily admire people for jumping up and trying to have a fight with the British, but that's certainly what happens in the central square. Yeah, so there, there is, as you say, a sense of inevitability about what was going to happen. Um, there were there were gunshots. And in fact, the, the visual representation of the moment is sitting right here in front of me it's on the front cover of your book it's a i suppose quite a period um woodcut would you say i suppose it's a woodcut. that's right yeah yeah, yeah. and engraving. it's very i think very strongly influenced by the uh, famous engraving of the boston massacre by the paul, paul revere, revere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah uh, and you can see that that's the um the, the visual kind of power is very much tapped into that uh, i mean i should also say that that shooting is stylized in other ways so the the, the what happens initially is that one of the militia guards loses his discipline and fires his rifle at the Americans. And at that point, the Americans are kind of retreating. So they, they've initially confronted uh, the Brits, the, the militia guards, but they've actually been kind of pushed back, partly by the bayonets of these British guards who kind of lined up against them. 
they've actually been pushed back closer to the part of the prison the Americans are supposed to be in. The Americans claim that the prison governor ordered the militia guards to fire. I personally don't think that's true. I think it's very unlikely that that happened. What seems to have happened is that one guard opened fire, then another, then another. But the illustration, I think, comes into the picture because for an agonizing period of anywhere between half an hour and an hour after the initial shooting, the British militia guards actually go into the separate prison block areas, so the outside yards around each prison block, and effectively try and shoot the prisoners. And that's the reason that you end up getting, you know, more than 50 people end up being uh, seriously wounded or killed, nine killed and 40 or so seriously injured, because actually these militia guards kind of turn into death squads during that agonizingly long 30 to 60 minute period. Yeah. And that's the part I think the illustration is trying to capture. Yeah, and and and. I mean, it's kind of a crass comparison when you talk about it in these ways, but it, it is worse than the Boston, Boston massacre by, if you quantify it, I mean, it's not really like kind of, I mean, but I think five people maybe died in Boston, something like this. We're talking about a sustained period of, of terror over the next well, few this, hours, aren't we? I mean, you'll be amused by this piece of, I was just on a tour for the book in the United States. And one of the questions I got, um, I think I was in Dallas. Actually, maybe it makes sense for Dallas. One of the questions I got was, only nine people were killed. How can you call this a massacre? <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, well, maybe the economy of massacres has changed since then. But I pointed out to this obstreperous kind of like massacre <laughs> denier that actually the uh, massacre of this period for Americans is the Boston massacre. So again, for your listeners, 5th of March, 1770, that's the moment where a crowd is protesting the fact that there are British troops surrounding the customs house in Boston. And they're there obviously to ensure that the customs house is able to do its work of extracting taxes on goods that are coming into Boston. So there's this angry crowd outside, which gathers pretty much every day. And on this particular day, 5th of March, 1770, uh, they're throwing trash and snowballs and stones at the British. There's a shooting, firing begins, and five Americans are killed. By comparison, nine people are killed in 1815. So for those people who are actually in the prison, I mean, one of them actually goes off and writes in his diary, this is worse than the massacre at Boston yeah. in 1770. And it is, in a way. Yeah, and, and technically it is. And yet pretty much every school kid in the US knows about the Boston massacre. I mean, even now, like this is absolutely textbook. Like everyone talks about it, right? It's one of the stages that leads towards the American revolution. If you, if you go to Boston, there's a huge memorial to the Boston massacre there on the common. But the Dartmoor Massacre, four more people killed than in 1770, yeah. totally vanishes from American but, history. But more than that, because I was doing some work on the Boston Massacre recently, and what was so striking about it was not just the, the, the fact that it happened, but just the speed with which it was turned into, I wouldn't say propaganda, because that's not quite the right word, but it was kind of embraced within the, the greater cause of the Sons of Liberty and so, so on. And... So within months, you had, well, within days almost, you have the, um, the like, kind of the, the, the Revere illustration was produced so quickly. And then you'll have, like, accounts of town meetings, which are then put into transcripts, which are then put into pamphlets, which are then disseminated to Europe. Was yep. a similar thing, like, kind of in play here, or did it really, was it just kind of hushed up? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, I would say you're absolutely right to call it propaganda, by the way. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I don't think we need a neutral understanding of that term, right? Like, I mean, it was very often either exaggerated or presented in super lurid terms, and it was tidied up mm. to make it seem super patriotic. And yeah, I mean, the Boston Massacre news had traveled throughout the American colonies before it got back to Britain. Mm. So it was already doing work for the cause of American independence mm. way before Britain had a chance to respond to it. That's absolutely what the prisoners at Dartmoor imagined would happen with the Dartmoor massacre. So when the smoke begins to clear, you know, it's sort of 7, 7.30 on the evening of April the 6th, 1815, there are all this blood in the yards, there are groaning men still too scared actually to be carried off to the prison infirmary because they're worried they're gonna get shot by these guards who are still outside. That's the moment where a real conviction begins to take hold amongst the prisoners at Dartmoor that there will be a reckoning that either they will be remembered forever as martyrs to American liberty, or that the British will at the very least be held to account. But of course, the problem is, you know, Britain and the United States have been trying to talk their way out of this war that neither side really wants for more than a year at that point. I mean, you know, the stuff in Ghent has been happening at that point for more than a year. Is this event going to be allowed to reopen the war? 
It's also the case that a number of powerful Americans are currently in London. So people like Albert Gallatin, the former Treasury Secretary, Henry Clay, the congressman, they've arrived in London to discuss a new commercial treaty with Britain. So they're already moving on, they're turning the page, and they're looking towards that relationship between Britain and the United States that I mentioned a bit earlier, one where Britain basically benefits from bankrolling American expansion. They're basically putting down the ink for that deal at this very moment in London. So there's no interest on the part of the American government in opening this up. There's no interest on the part of the British government. The Americans uh, ag agree to an investigation led by the British government, but they put in charge an extremely callow merchant uh, who just happens to be in London, an American merchant called Charles King. He is paired with an extremely experienced British military investigator, you get effectively a kind of whitewash report, which says probably the soldiers shouldn't have you know, shot at anyone, but it's impossible for us to figure out which soldier actually did the shooting. So there should be no consequences. And the Americans meekly accept this. Probably the biggest concession you get from Britain is that um, uh, George IV effectively says, okay, well, maybe this is a bad thing. I sort of apologize. Uh, I would don't you know like why some this, Yeah, it all sounds so familiar. I can't kind of quite <laughs> put my finger on it there's something yeah. familiar about this story um <laughs> well listen it's all there that the full story and not just of the massacre but of the conditions that created the prison of how the i mean it's a fascinating story in itself of how the the prison came to be and of course you've teased out so much of the kind of human life that went into that prison from you know the kind of the inmates but also for those who were sent down to govern this um this place in quite uncertain like kind of territory, I suppose. So um, geographical territory and also intellectual territory, I should say. But um, let me let me ask you one last question, if I may, um, which w will give you hopefully the opportunity to think about material history as well. If you could bring one memento back from 1815 to have today to remind you of um, either this conversation or the broader story that you've told in The Hated Cage, would you like anything in particular? So you sprung this on me just before we started taping. So I haven't had a lot of time to think about it, but you know, instantly in my mind, maybe this reflects the perversity of my own historical imagination. I'd take the Beasley effigy. Like I would oh, grab man. it when it comes down from the prison and I would take that and put it in my office because in a way this, so that the, hate, the hated cage is the prison, right? Like this refers to a poem from the 1820s about Dartmoor, but there are kind of lots of hated cages in this book. I mean, there's race, right? I think also nationality mm -hmm. can sometimes be a kind of cage, right? And I think that that moment where the prisoners realize that the enemy may actually be the guy who is supposed to be helping them is such a kind of powerful one for me. And it reminds us that when you peel away nations and you peel away race, and we are all individuals. Mm -hmm. And as individuals, we bleed, we suffer, we starve, we, you know, we yearn. I mean, all of those things that the prisoners at Dartmoor did. And I think this is a moment of solidarity around their basic humanity and and to to some extent however macabre the effigy of beasley is a symbol of that so if i could i'd steal that i mean they might chase me right they were trying to burn it so yeah it's the kind of thing you kind of forget it's in the house and you come in and it gives you a start i suppose <laughs> we'd, we'll, we'll let you have that and i'll have the i'll have the baseball that's the that's what <laughs> i'll that, that's worth more <laughs> that'd be that'd be a good thing to have all right well absolute pleasure to talk to you nick guy um author of the hated cage which is highly recommended of course thank you very much for coming on Travels Through Time. Thank you so much, Peter. Okay, so that was me, Peter Moore, talking to Nicholas Guy, the author of this book, which I'm going to hold nice and still for you for a moment so you can get a good look at it. The Hated Cage, an American tragedy in Britain's most terrifying prison. I think I've read that properly. It's a really fascinating book. Do check it out if you're interested in that era of history. Thanks for listening today or indeed watching. We'll be back very soon. Goodbye.